It's been nearly 30 years since Jurassic Park thrilled audiences around the world. And to this day, many composers consider the score the finest writing of the modern film era. A larger majority recognized the significance of the album, citing the seemingly unparalleled performance by the session musicians and the astonishing fidelity of the recording itself. These three independent elements each seem to have been individually executed at the highest level of quality, the combination of which seems to place this album in a category of its own. But what specifically makes this soundtrack so special sounding? What were the technical elements behind it? Jurassic Park was recorded and mixed by Sean Murphy at the Sony scoring stage in the spring of 1993, and his work earned him an Oscar. Murphy favors a classical approach to his recordings, where the overwhelming majority of sound comes from a five-microphone array first used by the classical label Decca in the late 50s. Three Neumann M50s are arranged in a triangle above the conductor's podium at a carefully chosen height between 9 and 12 feet. Two flanking microphones, in this case Shep's MK21s, are placed equidistant from the tree on either side of the podium. These outriggers are set about halfway through the first violin and cello sections. On average, these five well-placed microphones will make up about 90% of the sound of the recording. To this day, the M50 remains a favorite microphone of classical recording engineers. Their pattern is omnidirectional, which means they accept signal from any source which surrounds the microphone. Where other microphones may reject signal from the sides or rear, these microphones prioritize all positions equally and are thus ideal room pickups. Each microphone seems to have a sort of unique acoustic footprint or a sonic signature of some sort. The M50s are renowned for their ability to provide an especially warm-sounding low end. These also reliably provide an accurate depth of field, creating a true image of the depth and width of the ensemble. Neumann only made around 500 of these remarkable microphones, and the current resale value starts at around $15,000 per unit. As with most technology of that era, they can be somewhat problematic and costly to maintain. Interestingly, both the three tree microphones and the two Sheps outriggers were powered by Avalon preamps, specifically the MK2, a two-channel preamp that is mostly retired from action. In fact, a Google search of these preamps leads to very few results. They are nearly completely forgotten from history. In modern times, Pueblo audio preamps are overwhelmingly found in use for the same task, and the Grace preamps before them. Both Grace and Pueblo aspire to have a completely transparent sonic footprint, providing only volume with no color. Avalon is not always considered a member of the transparent-sounding family. Many will consider the Avalon tone colored in a slightly glossy hi-fi way. Now, most engineers will agree that a preamp will color the sound proportionally less than the microphones do. But it is interesting to consider that at least part of the somewhat enchanting Jurassic Park sound came from these forgotten preamps. The wide cardioid Sheps MK21s were used as the string booster microphones, also called outriggers or wides. Where a cardioid will listen primarily to what is placed directly in front of it, and omnis all around them, the wide cardioid is somewhat in between the two. For a large ensemble, this has the effect of boosting the strings and widening the overall sound of the orchestra. Hence their name, string boosters. Many times, 
They are also angled downward into the string section, so they may reject sounds coming from the brass and percussion. It is also a tradition that many contractors will sit their finest players closest to the podium, so it may be the case that the rear players are weaker to some extent, and one wouldn't want to hear them being especially featured. Now, while we are talking about strings for a moment, let's spend some time considering the orchestra size of Jurassic Park. For much depends not only on the quality of the players, but the quantity. The Jurassic Park string ensemble consisted of 16 firsts, 14 seconds, 14 violas, 12 celli, and 8 basses. A remarkable size even by today's standards. Where many composers fantasize about the huge and brilliant brass writing in the score, it is only this robust string section that allows the brass to sound balanced in relation. With too few chairs in the strings, the brass and percussion easily overpower them, especially in higher dynamic writing. Remember that each element of a John Williams score sounds in the room, even the synthesizers via speakers next to the keyboardist. There is no striping or multi-tracking. This requires an immensely well-thought-out orchestration and a mindful engineer making sure nothing unwanted sticks out. This means that all the score elements affecting dynamics and range must be carefully weighed against each other in order to achieve that desirable tutti sound. At first, this sounds like an easy task, but it's not. In many ways, Williams makes this look effortless but it was a brain puzzle, which required substantial thought and experience. Not only does the musical writing and notation need to be first-rate, the monitoring and adjustments given from the podium and booth must be first-rate as well. Both Williams and Murphy must have been carefully listening to this balance and actively addressing elements which stuck out or were underpowered. As evidence of this, Let's listen first to a segment of the original soundtrack. Now, let's take Williams and Murphy out of the equation but keep the same notations. This is an American recording made in Seattle with completely different personnel. In the first segment, did you notice how much louder the ostinato played by the winds, piano, and glockenspiel is when compared to the original soundtrack? One would assume if Murphy was mixing and Williams conducting in Seattle, this line, which really has no melodic musical importance other than providing a motor, would not be as far in the forefront as it is here. Let's compare them back to back. This seems to suggest that both Williams and Murphy prefer a mix where the combination of instruments is uniform, especially high-ranged elements like flutes and glockenspiels. Next, let's compare where the theme opens up. To my ears, the Seattle version sounds much more march-like and much less majestic. Here, have a listen. Specifically listen to the connections between the notes.
Tenuto is the classical designation which addresses the length of written notes. If a composer specifically wanted long note values, they may write tenudo or sustenudo in the parts to ensure it. Otherwise, it is more or less left to groupthink. It may be the case that Williams gave this specific instruction verbally at the initial recording session, or otherwise gave a similar instruction via his conducting pattern. Or it may be the case that the musicians in Los Angeles naturally performed it in such a connected manner. Now let's keep Williams in the equation, but subtract Murphy. This is from a recent recording Williams did in Vienna with tonemeisters from Deutsche Grammophon. Well, naturally and immediately, you hear more of the room sound, as this was recorded in a large classical hall, a much wetter environment than the Sony scoring stage. The high ostinato, which was so problematic in the Seattle version, is kept in check here, just as it was in the studio version. Perhaps Williams was able to adjust things via a quick note or a gesture at the podium. Where the theme opens up, the Viennese version is somewhat in between the overly connected style recorded in Los Angeles and the March-like setting from Seattle. And of course, one would certainly expect a pretty high-quality recording from such a renowned ensemble as the Vienna Phil. In addition to the Avalon preamps, Murphy used Avalon equalizers on the Jurassic Park soundtrack and other scores of the age. Specifically, the recently discontinued 2055 Stereo EQ. I was able to find an interview where Murphy gave the specific EQ settings of his Avalon EQ for the Williams score to The Patriot, recorded seven years later. These are those exact settings. No detail about the width of the curve was given, but one can assume in any type of master EQ that the settings were rather broad strokes. I happen to have an Avalon 2055 EQ, and it certainly has a unique sound in the higher register. Let's give a listen to it using the settings just mentioned. One of the hallmarks of the original album sound is the Sony scoring stage, which has a somewhat dry but dense sound to it. It is a much drier sound than the Abbey Road Studio one, where Williams has recorded nearly all of his London scores. Murphy has often spoken about using a two-reverb approach, where one of the reverbs provides an overall tail for the entire ensemble, and the second, shorter reverb, fills the gaps in between the microphones, especially the spot microphones. According to my research, the Lexicon 480L Digital Reverb was used by Murphy on this score. He has mentioned that he specifically likes the large hall and medium random hall presets, so one would assume this setting was used verbatim, or at least as a starting point. Universal Audio makes a Lexicon certified plugin of this vintage reverb unit. Let's give a listen to the sound of this large hall patch using the UAD plugin. The Sony scoring stage is true to form with regards to the performance of the musicians. There is no upper balcony to play with or modular ceiling like there is at Air Lindhurst. There are no rotating side panels like there are at Skywalker or Capitol Records. There is simply no place to hide or become overly isolated or dampened. What the tree microphones hear is the true sound of what is happening in the room. So rather remarkably, 
the unbelievably tight and complex balance of the score must have existed in the room during the session. According to my research, there was no sonic trickery which glued the sections together via the use of technology. It was simply wonderful playing and masterful microphone technique that, in addition to the writing and orchestration itself, makes this recording so special. Let's listen to the opening of The Journey to the Island track from the original soundtrack. Listen carefully how each element is simultaneously clear and legible, yet not particularly individual enough sounding, that it draws attention to itself in an unfavorable way. Achieving not only individual clarity, but overall unity, is the telltale sign of an enlightened orchestral recording. It is also remarkably hard to achieve, especially in a pickup group such as this orchestra. One of the most interesting tracks of the original soundtrack is track 9, Dennis Steals the Embryo. Here, a breathy shakuhachi, a Japanese bamboo flute, is used to exotically accent the part where the villain steals the precious DNA sequences of the dinosaurs. The shakuhachi was recorded with a Sheps hypercardioid at a height that was probably closer than the other woodwinds in order to retain its high end and breathy sound. The reverb also seems to be longer on the shakuhachi. When recording flutes, aiming the microphone towards the mouthpiece can pick up on more of the breathy quality of the sound. A few of the cues on the soundtrack employ the use of a 44-person choir, which was recorded using two Neumann 140 overall microphones, though it is certain that some of their sound came from the overall Decca tree microphones. Unlike many Williams scores, Jurassic Park employs the piano as both a soloist and member of the ensemble. The piano, most likely Sony's Steinway D, was recorded behind the violins using two Neumann 87 microphones. Listening to the piano, you can hear it is a balanced, somewhat roomy sound. So we can assume the microphones were placed with a bit of space between them and the instrument. This always becomes a balancing act between getting a spacious sounding spot mic and limiting unwanted bleed from the French horns stationed directly behind the instrument. We can also clearly hear that both of the microphones were both panned to the left to make the appearance of the piano left of center in the mix. And this would be where it was actually seated in the room. Just because a stereo microphone system was employed, doesn't by default mean the panning has to be far left and far right for the microphones. Additionally, just because a microphone was rigged doesn't mean it has to make it to the final mix. If you are happy with just the overall tree sound, know that a majority of fantastic classical recordings were made just using this approach. Murphy used two Sheps 33s as surround microphones, sometimes called ambient microphones. Quite often, these are placed on very tall stands in the furthest corner of the front of the room. Sometimes they face the orchestra, and sometimes they face open space or away from the orchestra. It is unclear whether these microphones were solely used in the movie version of the score where they fed the rear surrounds, or whether they made it into the album version. I think it is fair to say that Jurassic Park has a more ambient sound 
when compared to most modern recordings. Remarkably, this score was recorded in just eight days, starting in March of 93. To this day, it remains one of the most enchanting collaborations between John Williams, Sean Murphy, and the Los Angeles session-playing community.